Brendan's here to bail me out when I make like really stupid mistakes. My name is Jim Morrow. I work for Oracle. And, oh, Jesus. All right. And this is Brendan Gregg, who used to work for Oracle. And uh, now wearing a giant t-shirt. Also known as Shouting Guy, in case you've seen the video. Right. That's, right. That's my claim to fame. And this is uh, a lousy view of what everybody wants under their Christmas tree this year. Uh, forthcoming book on uh, D-Trace, actually it'll be out sometime in February that Brendan and I have spent the last year of, uh, of our lives sweating blood on. Um, it's going to come in at about, and this is the D-Trace boff, shameless plug notwithstanding, it is applicable. So bear with me here, but really, uh, we've, this is uh, going to come in at about 1,000, 1,100 pages. It has over 230 D-Trace scripts in it. Over 170, 180 one-liners, yeah, something like that. Um, well, it's a book about using D-Trace. That's all it's about. It's divided up into a couple introductory chapters on the language and, and the, the fundamental aspects of D-Trace. And then it gets into it. System view, disk I.O., file system, network, network protocols, um, D-Tracing applications, D-Tracing databases, um, Brendan wrote some scripts that are actually more complex than some of the kernel subsystems I've looked at. And it's just really about, I, want, I have a system I want to take a look at, I have a problem I need to solve with D-Trace, and either I know D-Trace or I know it a little or I know it a lot, what the hell, I'm going to open the book and you're going to find a script that, if it doesn't actually give you the observability that you're looking for, it's going to get you very, very close and give you a building block to start with. Um, so, for example, um, oh man, you might have to drive here, Brandon. You'll have to bear with me. I flew in from Tel Aviv last night, um, so I'm severely jet lagged. All right, so let me. Do, 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 do. What, will, what happens if I do that? Is that readable? Probably not. No, it oh, all right. So that that didn't work. Anyway, so, nah, I'll get there, folks. Bear with me. All right. This isn't working. You got some zoomed out and some top of the title, but go through now. Oh, yeah. yeah. All right. So let me try. That's hopefully a little better. So this is just um, kind of what a chapter looks like. This is the network chapter. So this is an example of a one-liner that allows you to see network connections and gives you examples of the resulting output. Um, so there's uh, lots of one-liners in here that, that are explained and, sh and demonstrated along with what the one-liner does and what the output, uh, the output that's generated. Further beyond, when you go beyond the one-liners, uh, we get into, um, I'm sorry, so the one-liners are decomposed in the case of the network chapter by protocols, by events, and things like that. TCP statistics, UDP statistics, socket statistics, things like that. And then when you get beyond that, you get into um, some of the amazing scripts that Brendan wrote. They're organized here by table, so you can do a quick table lookup and see what scripts are available. This exists in every chapter. And then uh, down to the scripts themselves. Um, they're line numbered, so the explanations actually make sense. And then, then you'll see the resulting output. The other thing we're doing to make your life a little easier is all of the scripts that are in the book are going to be on the D-Trace book website, dtracebook.com, which exists as a domain name, but um, that's all today. <laughs> so that, that's, that's, that's the next project. Okay, so let me go over to Open Solaris and see if I can... Okay, so... Uh, here's a root window and open source. So, how many people actually know what D-Trace is? How many people have actually used D-Trace? Okay, so it, it's a mix, and obviously in an hour um, we can't we can't teach you D-Trace. We can't go through all the all the fundamentals of uh, we can't go through all the aspects of D-Trace. So, uh, what we want to do here is just basically take any questions you might have about D-Trace. And, and I'll just start talking and then Brendan's going to pick me up when I fall uh, just to try to get us into the mindset and the flow. And for those of you that are potentially less familiar with D-Trace, 
um, you know, uh, hopefully uh, give you a little bit, a uh, little bit more to go on. So uh, the fundamentally, DTrace is an extremely complex software framework that gives you visibility into the entire kernel and the entire software stack of all the software running on the system. And it does, do, it does this through the, um, the insertion of dynamic instrumentation points that we call probes. So using DTrace, you can insert these dynamic points of instrumentation into any of the kernel subsystems, as well as to any of your user application code. And within these dynamic points of instrumentation, what DTrace gives you the ability to do is say, hey, software, when you get here, stop for a microsecond, give me some data, collect a timestamp, Give me a stack trace, show me who's running, do a whole bunch of different things, and then carry on with the job you were supposed to do. So that's essentially what a probe does in DTrace, is you insert a probe in the code, with the probe in the code, the code executes, the probe fires when we hit the point that was instrumented, the entry point of a kernel function or an application function, the return point of a, of a kernel function, uh, one, of the, uh, one of the name providers, which is a, a, a well-defined namespace in the code path, the probe fires, you collect the data you wish to collect, and your software moves on and executes. And then DTrace will, uh, will gather up that data for you and bring it back to you in a variety of different ways, depending on what you told DTrace to do. And when you're all done, DTrace just simply walks away and, and completely, completely gets out of your way. Um, it is absolutely and truly completely dynamic. When you're not actually enabling any DTrace probes, DTrace is not in the way, it's not there, it doesn't exist. It only goes where you tell it to go, and when you're done, it goes back home and gets out of your way. Um, it provides a variety of different um, methods and functions you can use for capturing and displaying data. So uh, if you want to see what probes you have on your system, um, anybody having trouble reading that? <laughs> All right, we'll go through this line by line. No, just kidding. So um, DTrace-L lists all the probes that, that are uh, installed on the system, and I'm looking at a Slayer's 11 machine, and the probe format very simply is probe number, don't worry about it, and the four major components of what you, uh, that make up every DTrace probe, which is a provider, a module, a function, and, and a probe name. And again, we don't have time to go into a full-out DTrace um, tutorial. I'm just going to tell you very briefly that a provider is a DTrace abstraction, which is essentially a library of probes. What a provider does is it manages sets of probes in various areas of, of the kernel for us. So for example, if I want to use DTrace to take a look at Solaris scheduling activity, the Solaris kernel scheduler is an enormously complex kernel subsystem. So I could buy a copy of Solaris internals, which I would encourage you all to do, and I could read about the Solaris kernel scheduler, or I could simply take a look at the DTrace sketch provider, and using this, this one of the many providers in DTrace, I see I have some probes with some very interesting names. I have a probe called on CPU. That's a probe that fires when a thread gets put on a CPU. I have a probe called off CPU. That's a probe that gets far, fired when my thread's taken off CPU. So I have a couple, I have a couple DTrace probes here that allow me to instrument my code and see how long threads are spending on CPUs. I have probes called sleep, fires when a thread gets put to sleep. I have probes called wake up, fires when a thread gets woken up. I can see how long my threads are spending sleeping, how long they're spending on CPU. More importantly, what the, sketch, the, the, the point I'm making here with the sketch provider is one of the great things some of these providers do for us is they abstract a complex area of the operating system such that I can use DTrace to instrument that area of the operating system and learn interesting things about what my system is doing and understand the behavior of my system without having to, uh, without having to learn that particular subsystem. If I take a look at the I.O. provider, I don't know what I just did there. I know what I did there. <laughs> Brendan, you may have to drive soon, dude. Okay. We have this provider called I.O. Disk I.O. is a critically important component of every workload. You need to understand it. It induces latency. Latency is your enemy. Performance is all about 
chasing latency. That's what it's all about. Um, the I.O. provider abstracts the disk I.O. SIP sub subsystem for us such that I don't have to spend six months studying the SCSI driver and the various uh, HBA drivers. I have a probe called start and a probe called done. That fires when I start a disk I.O. That fires when I finish a disk I.O. Wait start fires when I start waiting for a disk I.O. or I get put to sleep for the I.O. Wait done fires when I'm done waiting for an I.O. One of the providers that Brendan wrote that has become one of my favorites is the IP provider, right? Instrumenting the TCP IP stack was enormously complex. And by virtue of the fact that Brendan received 10,000 emails about TCP snoop being broken in the DTrace toolkit is a testament to how complex it was to, to instrument the TCP IP subsystem. Now with Brendan's IP provider, I have probes called send, I have probes called receive. Now I can very easily instrument the networking subsystem in Solaris and hopefully soon Mac and, and other operating systems that, that have DTrace. Mac OS X has DTrace by the way. I actually DTraced a spinning beach ball last week. Um, <laughs> <laughs> hey, I don't have a life, what can I say? Um, DTrace is in FreeBSD beginning with the 7.1 release, I think, and it's in 8.0 now. Um, so again, these providers, going back to uh, the, uh, one of the fundamental uh, components of DTrace, we have these providers. These providers abstract complex areas of the system for us and allow us to instrument these without necessarily becoming experts in that subsystem. And the other thing providers do for us is they give us stable probes. They give us a stable DTrace interface. One of the things that Brendan preaches, and rightly so, is as you use DTrace, you want to uh, potentially avoid and um, the biggest provider in the system, which is the FPT provider. FPT stands for Function Boundary Tracing, and the FPT provider is an extremely powerful provider. It allows us to instrument the entry and return point of every function in the kernel. Every function in the kernel I can instrument with FPT. But because FPT exposes the entry and return point of every function in the kernel, use of the probes built, uh, managed by the FPT provider is not guaranteed to work from release to release to release. These are unstable probes. You install a patch, you install an update, and your DTrace script that worked with the FPT provider in Solaris 10 Update 8 may not work anymore with Solaris 10 Update 9 if you're using FPT probes or one of the other providers that aren't guaranteed to give you stable probes. Why? Because again, we're exposing the actual functions in the kernel. Function names may change, arguments passed, return values, any number of things may change with the installation of a patch or a release. So you need to be cognizant of that when you're using DTrace with the FPT and some of the other unstable providers. However, if you're using the sketch provider, the I.O. provider, the IP provider, any of the stable providers, one of the things you get is a guarantee that those probes will not change and you'll be able to use those DTrace scripts um, for, the, uh, for the foreseeable future. Brendan, did you want to add anything? I <laughs> Knock your lights out. Sure, so I, I might just stop Jim like there because Jim's doing the DTrace tutorial on Friday and I think if I don't stop him, he's going to talk for the next seven hours and cover the tutorial right now, which is in some ways is fine. Um, here are the birds of a feather. We've got no sort of set agenda, so we can ask questions. Um, you can, especially if you've, if, you, if you've been looking at performance problems, if you've used DTrace a little bit and you're trying to get your head around how to make it more practical in your environment. So use this opportunity now to ask what you'd like us to talk about. Obviously, both Jim and I can talk for weeks nonstop uh, about any of these topics. But what's interesting right now that, that, that you'd like to um, Sorry, yeah, so Go about? ahead. Yeah, it's a, it's a classic question, but I think it's a reasonable one. Um, you, you might not have the Solaris source code to hand for one reason or another. Um, could you talk around uh, how uh, you would use DTrace to uh, find your way around the kernel without, it, without source code and how having or not having source code affects the utility of DTrace? So, this is a good question and it's about DTrace is, is some people look at DTrace and some of the complicated scripts and it looks like you 
you may need to be Jim Marrow in order to use it and have a, a good understanding or good grasp of Solaris internals. When I first used DTrace, I was not a Sun employee. I did not have access to the kernel source code and Open Solaris was not public. I wrote the original versions of TCP Snoop, which, um, as Jim's already mentioned, it used the raw kernel providers without access to the kernel source code, uh, which was actually quite difficult. But to give you some insight on, onto how that works, Jim's somewhere else. Okay, so thanks. I don't know what you were going to do. Now, I'm going to be typing a little bit slowly unless I can figure uh, out how to switch this into Dvorak. This is a QWERTY keyboard. I don't know how people type on these things. <laughs> so with DTrace, in fact, I can just step through quickly how I wrote the original TCP snoop, which, which dug through kernel internals without ever having seen the kernel internals. And, and this will give you at least um, a taste of what it's like to tackle uh, detracing some source code that you, that you don't have access to. And just while, while he's typing, so he doesn't embarrass himself too much, um, this is actually one of the things that we try to, it, it, it is a great question, that we try to illustrate extensively throughout the book, is there's a subsystem where there's a particular area that you're interested in detracing, you don't have access to the source code, here's how you can do detrace to get um, um, to learn what you need and observe what you need to learn about that particular subsystem without ever actually having to go to the, uh, what are you doing to my laptop? <laughs> <laughs> without ever actually having to go, uh, go to the source code. Yeah. I need my Dvorak mapping. Anyway, so um, <laughs> the, the FBT, it's not there yet, so I'm still in query, so I'm still typing it uh, in first gear. The FBT provider lets you look at the whole code. So here I am, I, I'm not a kernel engineer, I don't have access to the source code, I don't know what any of these things mean, but I'm interested in looking at TCP functions. Being an ex-sysadmin, I know how to drive grep, so let's grep for TCP. And you'll see there's a whole heap of them out there. Um, as it turns out, kernel engineers, e even though the code looks inscrutable, uh, they aren't that deliberately malicious, they do have Sometimes reasonable names, uh, TCP options and, and IPsec TCP call, whatever. These guys look like they're, they're likely to be what I'm interested in if I'm uh, detracing TCP. So I can use detrace to match them. So just using wildcards and the probe name. So now I'm listing uh, all. I'm listing all probes having a little bit of trouble with this keyboard. Listing all probes that contain the letters TCP. Okay. Now I don't know how you people type on this. All the keys are in the wrong place. So I'm using a dtrace one line to match every probe that contains the letters TCP, and I'm aggregating on probe func, which is the name of the function. What I'm doing is I'm performing an experiment. Uh, understanding a system, and this is something if you do a lot of performance analysis, you get good at. On one hand, you can use observation. On the other hand, you can perform small experiments to figure things out. This system, which is called Solaris 11, if I can initiate, am I over a TCP session to get to this? Uh, you should be, but it wasn't working well. Okay, well, I'm, over a, I'm over a TCP session, SSH I presume? Yeah. So I'm SSH'd onto this system. So if I hit the space bar a few times, I know I'm sending some TCP packets to and from this system. Oh no, you're on Solaris, you're not SSH doctor, That's a, you're, you're, you're running in a virtual machine. Right, but, but uh, I think, think this session is actually a safe one for that. Oh, okay. Or not? No. No, no. it wasn't. Okay. Um, does it have an IP address I can... Yes, it does. So, this one? Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> I'm looking for the, 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 the C key. Where is it? It's down there next to the uh, X. Okay. Where it's supposed to be. Where it's supposed to be. <laughs> <laughs> so, 
while he's while he's struggling, let me give you the bottom line answer to your question. You don't need access to the Solaris kernel, and you don't actually need knowledge of the Solaris kernel um, to make really good use of DTrace and understand uh, solve a lot of your performance problems and understand the behavior of your system. You don't. I mean, I I rarely go to the kernel source code when I'm working on a real problem with DTrace. It's it's very rare that I need to do that. Most of the time I can learn what I need to learn using the methods Brendan's talking about here. Just my intuitive knowledge of the subsystem I'm looking at, whether it's CFS or TCP or the scheduler or whatever, and go from there. Okay, so, so now that I've figured out how Jim's running this, uh, I've created a small experiment by SSHing to localhost, which is going to go through the TCP handshake and SSH will do some negotiation. So some TCP packets will happen. I frequency counted the kernel TCP functions. And there's all sorts of interesting things like TCP connect IPv6. I don't think I'm using IPv6. Well, that depends on local host resolves. Right. TCP con con, TCP accept. A lot of these look very likely, but again, uh, you may have no familiarity with the source code. I can use MDB and a feature of the kernel called CTF for the symbol information for these. So if I take TCP accept, okay, so now I'm, I'm teasing apart more information. This seems to be something that's likely TCP accept. That may be something that fires as it accepts a new TCP session. I've now determined the arguments to TCP accept. It has a SOC lower handle type, a SOC lower handle type, a SOC upper handle type, and a cred type. Again, I don't know what any of these mean, presuming I don't have access to the source code. Um, I can also use MDB and the CTF information to find out what they are. I'm missing my uh, no type information available for that name. Huh. Okay. Stop lower handle type. Zero. Right, let's try print type. So what Brendan's showing you here, there you go. Uh, what Brendan's showing you here again is by, by using MDB, which is a debugger that ships with all Solaris systems. Um, if you are digging into specific kernel functions and you want to start getting one way, you want to start going a little bit deeper, you want to see what arguments are passed to those kernel functions, you can use the debugger and actually get the function prototype. It will give you all the arguments passed and then you can further drill down on the argument list and look at the enumerated data types and see what, what the various data structure members are. So yeah, I, I don't know what SOC lower handle type, it's probably just a mapping for an integer. Um, credential type has all sorts of interesting members. If I don't have access to the source code on Solaris, would these be documented anywhere? Does anyone know? Think before open Solaris. Like if you ever dug through things like this, you've either got Solaris internals, the book, or user includes sys, has a bunch of header files, and sometimes you get lucky and a lot of the kernel structs are documented in there. So the first thing I did was I found out which functions fired. The second thing I did was I found out what the arguments to the functions were, and now I'm looking at the, the contents Can to I the arguments. Let me know when you're done. I'll do a simpler example. Yeah. Almost done. All right. And now let me take TCP accept and look at the kernel stack trace. This is more information about it. It's showing me, I don't know how familiar you, you are with kernel stack backtraces. It's showing me the code path or the ancestry to that function. So I can find out who calls who. Uh, Dtrace also has this option called flow indent where you can actually watch the, um, the 
progression of source code and which functions call which other functions. So, given, all, given some amount of time, you can sit down with a uh, undocumented piece of source code. Um, you don't have the actual source code to read, uh, and you can, in a way, I don't want to use the word de-engineer or disassemble, but you can find out, answer some of the problems that you'd like answered uh, based on undocumented binaries. I did this for TCP using the very similar steps you just saw there. Um, eventually figured out which were the functions for tracing packets in, packets out, establishing connections. And I did all of that without ever seeing a line of kernel code. So it can be done. It just takes a lot of time and some experimentation. Um, I've done this many times at customer sites as well where they have some binaries they don't have a source code for. However, they can apply a known workload. I like to use prime numbers like 23 or 17. They can apply, say, a known number of queries to a database or what have you, and then we frequency count all the functions that fire. What fires 23 times? That's probably related to the activity you're interested in. So it's a good question. Given some time, you can actually tease apart information and learn more and more and more, um, look at stack traces, and piece it together. So just kind of up-leveling that very quickly, then we'll go to the next question. Um, this, all, this may seem very rudimentary to all of you, and you may start throwing things at my head, kind of like Bart did before for some of you that were here for the previous thing. But um, don't lose sight of the fact that you, you can take advantage of Unix tools when you're using Dtrace, again, to figure things out when you're starting from the beginning. So if you're using a tool you're more familiar with, like MPSTAT, to look at, look at per CPU statistics, and you see this thing called INTR, which you know are interrupts, um, and you want to learn, you want to use Dtrace to learn more about those, but you have no idea of, well, what's in, what's available to me uh, in a Dtrace probe to learn about interrupts, um, you know, just, just grab for the string. And if you're, if you're, um, if you're actually not on a production system, and I say that um, because um, if you're going to do what I'm about to show you, you don't want to do it on a production system without knowing the probe effect and how many probes you are going to turn on. Now, Dtrace is a very, very lightweight tool. The cost of a probe in Dtrace is on the order of a microsecond or so. But if you're on a big, very, very, very busy production system and you end up typing something that's going to turn on 22,000 probes, um, it may have a probe effect. Um, now, I can tell you I've Dtraced thousands of customer systems over the last five years, and um, I've only ever gotten thrown off a site once. <laughs> so anyway. Um, so far. What's that? So far. Yeah, so um, you could do things like uh, Dtrace does support the use of uh, some wildcard expressions um, in the probe. So if, if you're doing things like chasing a system statistic, that you saw and you want to find out if Dtrace, um, what did I miss here? Oh, sorry. Uh, you want to find out, all right, so what's in, what, what will Dtrace make available to me? I saw that. MPSTAT MP statistic with INTR, it's interrupts. Uh, I see that they're non-zero, so now I just kind of willy-nilly through the string in, 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 in the Dtrace probe name. Now I can see, oh, well, this looks like it's probably where a lot of these INTR things are coming from. I could do stack traces and drill down from there. So, you know, again, to take advantage of the fact that it's a Unix tool. Go ahead. Um, another thing that's extremely useful for this kind of thing is the a.out functionality. We can just dump uh, everything that's in a binary that you've never seen before. You just, you know, call an a.out. Yeah. So, so oh, yeah, yeah. with the PID provider, I mean, the example I just did was for the kernel, and I can look at all the TCP functions. Um, you can do the same thing for user land binaries, um, and using PID, I can see, see. I could actually use other debugger tools to list the functions, the symbol information. What's key about Dtrace is I'm looking at the functions that actually fire. So if I normally list the symbols out of a program, it could have ten thousand functions. It could have a hundred thousand functions. If I'm a customer and I'm trying to get my head around that, there's no point reading through 100,000 functions if only seven of them fire for the event you're interested in, which is why it's really useful to then go and use Dtrace and find out which of these, which of these functions are actually firing. And if I can perform a known workload, I can 
find out which functions fire at the same rate as the workload. Apply 17 queries, like I said.